Glory to God. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10 and verse 38. That book can also be called Acts of the Holy Ghost by the Apostles. Actually, that would have been a better title. Acts of the Holy Ghost by the Apostles. Thank you, Father. Verse 38. That's where I'm taking my title for. It's been such a blessing being here since yesterday and soaking in the presence of God. I'm speaking on what I titled the dual mandate. The dual mandate. Again, when God's servant was speaking yesterday, that's what inspired the message. I'm used to that. I'm used to preparing messages. I'm praying. You know, I called God's servant uh, about a week or two ago. I said, I'm coming to your meeting, 10 days of fasting. Is there anything in your heart? He said, let the Lord lead you. So I began to seek the face of the Lord and I, I, I got ready and all of that. But I, I just knew quite well that this was such a phenomenal meeting. And God will be up to something. So when he began to speak yesterday and um, the media team wanted what was going to be the focus of my message, I said, Pastor George has changed everything. <laughs> Can I go and pray? And through the night, I'll get back to you this morning. So while waiting upon the Lord afresh, the Lord began to speak to me on this very important um, um, message I want to share with you in the thought service today. Very briefly though, is the dual mandate. Take a look again. Acts chapter 10. Number 38. On this scriptural verse, or from this scriptural verse, we see the ultimate example, Jesus. The Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and the enablement, the ability, the power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Take a closer look and you will notice the dual mandate in Acts chapter 10. I always prefer to start this with Jesus because he's the ultimate example. There is none of us before him, around him, after him that can compare in any dimension. He's the pattern example. His life was a lead to show to us what we must do and how we must live our lives. When he came, he came to do two things. And that mandate is the same mandate we carry. As I continue, you see why I said, you know, why I'm alluding it to the message that Pastor George preached last night. The Bible says how God anointed him with the enablement, with grace, with unction, with the backup of everything he needs to achieve two things. Number one, to do good. Number two, to solve spiritual problems. The mandate of God upon you and I is so clear on this earth. And I want to show to you very quickly how and why we must immediately embrace that in order to not only solidify our faith, but to keep growing and be more relevant in the scheme of God's things in this world. Very important. What are the mandates? Number one, the mandate is to solve spiritual problems. Number two, to meet physical needs. Solve spiritual problems and to meet physical needs. I call it the dual mandate. It's a mandate you'll be shocked. Runs through from Genesis to Revelation. Let me start from Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. The Bible says. And he put man that he had, he had, he had, he had. In the garden he had planted and gave man two mandates. Just two. Just two. What were they? Number one, to dress it. And number one, number two, to keep it. Genesis 2.15. The first assignment he gave to man. The same assignment Jesus came to do on the earth. Is somebody here with me today? For those of you listening online or from wherever you are, please keep listening. God has a word for you. The Bible says how God anointed Jesus with a sense of fullness. He says to do two things. Number one, to do good. To show to you that it's distinguished or separate from the second, the Bible uses the word a conjunction. He says, and he also went about healing all them that were oppressed of the devil. There are two different things. In the garden, we see it here. The Bible says, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Two things. 
to dress it physically. That's add value. Improve it. Embellish it. Decorate it. Don't leave it the same way. But don't just do it there. There is a devil as at this time, Satan had not shown up. Satan showed up chapter 3. All right? Now, so he warned in advance, there's going to be the spiritual dimension. Don't just beautify and decorate it. Don't just do something physical. Spiritually protect it. Because the spoiler, the deceiver, the destroyer is coming to do it. So he gave Adam the twofold assignment. Can I take you through scriptures very quickly? Go with me to Acts chapter 10 and verse number 4. Acts 10, 4. Acts 10, 4. In Acts chapter 10 verse 4, that was talking about the encounter of Cornelius with the angel of the Lord. Where God said to Cornelius, he said, Two things you have done that have come to me as a memorial. Two things heaven has recorded about you. I'm here to let you know that the dual mandate has two records about you in heaven. Your spiritual work and your physical work are recorded in heaven. Look at what the Bible says. An angel came from heaven and said to Cornelius, he said, number one, your prayers, and number two, your arms. Your prayer, your spiritual work, and number two, your arms, your physical work have been recorded as a memorial for you. Why? Christians carry the dual mandate to do both things in this world. If the world is hurting, God wants us to be the physical and the spiritual solution providers. There is something wrong. There is something contrary. There is something that makes Christianity to be of no effect, non-effective, if you and I do not arise to this responsibility. And so when God's servant was speaking last night and was talking about the heart of the world, how people are dying and going to hell. Man of God, you know, every time I hear the latest statistics, I'm sure by today, the number of COVID that is over 160. About 160 plus minus died. Do you know what comes to my mind first? How many of them went to heaven? How many of them went to hell? How many? Now, and they're projecting another 20 something thousand, another 30 something thousand. We're praying though. And I'm asking the Lord, how many more are going to die and go to a Christless eternity? Because those of us who are Christians must think in terms of the fact that the reason you and I have been put in this world, anointed and gifted and graced, is to be able to fulfill this dual mandate. The dual mandate is as expressed in the life of Jesus. The reason we are called, the reason we are equipped, anointed, gifted with the Holy Ghost is to do good and to help people recover from the oppression of the devil. Those are the two things. Our job is to look like Jesus. Our job is to be his hands and extension. Can I announce something to you? We live in a world that if we don't do those two things, we won't be able to meet up on what God expects for us to do. I run through you, run you through a couple of scriptures. Let me begin from Matthew chapter 15. In Matthew's gospel, I'll just give you some quotations because it, it, it's, it, I, I want you to see that what I'm talking about is scriptural, scripture based. In Matthew's gospel chapter 15, beginning at verse 29 to 32, I can't read it, I don't have all that time. It was talking about Jesus. How Jesus for three days fed, you know, spiritually fed the people. The Bible says he healed the sick. I mean, the lame walked. The dumb spoke. The blind saw. The crippled were restored. Massive walk. But when it was over, he looked at them and said, no, my walk is not finished. I will not be a good steward of the graces of your God, of your honor of God, of the oil of God upon my life if I don't do another thing. He called his apostles aside and said, guys, these people cannot go simply because we are excited. I don't know about you. As a pastor, people come to my meeting or people in my community have showed up. I mean, things are happening miraculously. I mean, I'm fulfilled. But not Jesus. Jesus said, no. He said, look for something and feed them. The Bible says he had compassion upon them. He said, my work of saving their souls is not enough. There is a physical hurt. There are people who are hurting. There are people who are in pain. There are people who are confused. Some people don't even know what it means to be a man or to be a woman or anything. They said, I feel like I'm in between. 
We live in a world where people believe that marriages can work. Getting, raising children is impossible. There are physical needs. There are spiritual needs. It's a mandate we carry. It's a mandate we carry. Saints of God, we didn't come to this world just to eat, live, and drink, and die. No, there's something more. You carry a mandate. You carry a responsibility. There are things that God wants us to do, and they are twofold. One is physical, another is spiritual. Doing one is not enough. Titus chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. Paul was writing to his son in the gospel by the name of Pastor Titus. And he said to Pastor Titus, he said, when you go, I said in the city of Crete from chapter 1, when he came to chapter 2, he said, I want you to do a number of things. And he mentioned them, basically there are two things. He said, show yourself a pattern of good works. All right? He, he said, number one, show yourself a pattern of good works. Then in doctrine, show on corruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Verse number 8. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, but that he does of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. You know what he was talking to, 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 the, to the bishop of the churches of, 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 of that city of Greece, ancient city of Greece, you know, called Crete? He said, when you go there, number one, establish yourself a pattern of good works. If you want these unbelievers to accept you, you must go with good works. Then number two, show spiritual soundness. Show integrity. Show character. That you need those two in order to be able to survive. Because people don't care the tongues you speak until they see the good that you do. That's what he was teaching him. He said, son, listen. That's the mandate. That's the pattern. That's the responsibility. We've got to do it. Who's going to take the people out of the streets? Thank God for the United States of America that even understands that there are things that the government cannot do. Shut down the church for one year, half the people is going to go berserk. You need a church to provide what nobody else can provide. You need a church. But this responsibility must be carried out twofold. Man of God, I'm, I'm trusting that the Lord is going to give clearer directive because I know you and you, I know your lovely wife. I know the kind of heart you have. One of the things I believe according to the word of God is that one of the phases that I believe God will be in time, God's servant is going to speak on that. Helping this church to get into is to become community champions. Amen. Changing stories. Entering into a community and show and overwhelming them with the reckless love of Jesus. Showing to them that we are here as a hand of God, as a heart of God, as an eye of God, as an ear of God. And by the time we do that and the gospel comes, it's going to be a walkover. How did missionaries penetrate Africa? They came with school, came with hospitals. And the people said, if you can come with this for us, whatever you are teaching us, we are ready. How God anointed Jesus to show you and I how it should be done. Number one, that's the order. That's the order who went about doing good and then healing them from the oppression of sin and Satan. The church lost that. I don't, I, I'm not trying to pull down you know, the African church. But that's one of the biggest problems we have in Africa. The country I hail from, Nigeria, I say it all the time. Massive churches, little social work. So much money in the church in Africa. And poverty all around. It doesn't look like the Christ of the Bible. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. We've got to, it's a two-fold message, two-part mandate. Listen to this, John chapter 10. Read this with me, verses 32 and 33. Verse 32, John chapter 10. I'd like you to open this. God, John's gospel, chapter number 10, verses 32 and 33. What do I want to call not too long? But I want us to see this so that by reason of this grace that God has poured out, 
that by reason of this grace that God has poured out, we can channel it to some eternal purpose. Listen, friends, there are too many people hurting. Forget about the facade that people show. They need us to just come and provide solution. Listen to what Jesus said. And Jesus said, Jesus answered them. He said, many good works have I showed you. Many good works, not a few, many. If I'm to be like him, I must be able to speak like him. Many good works. I know when you do some of these good works, they insult you, they take advantage of you, but it doesn't stop the necessity for good works. Because ultimately, they are not our rewarder. There is a rewarder who rewards us. He said, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? Remember, he was teaching us an example. Look at the next verse. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work, we do not stone you. That is to say, anytime you have a good work, our door is open. He said, but for blasphemy, and because thou being a man, makest thyself God. So Jesus was trying to help you. And remember, when Je whenever the Lord asks you a question, it's not because he's looking for information. Because before he asks it, he knows what it is. So what we are seeing here is showing you and I a strategy. And what's a strategy? It's a strategy of penetration. It's a strategy of takeover of communities. That no matter what they are, if you don't come first, that's the point. If you don't come first with the superiority of your faith, they will accept you. He said the only problem the world has is that when you come trying to quit, equate yourself as God, as a child of God, we are like God, we are the ambassadors of God, I'm a king's kid. There's nothing wrong with that, it's correct. He said but when you are dealing with these people, please understand the way they reason. How do they reason? When you come with a good work, we accept you. The one we have an initial problem with is your blasphemy. But guess what? The moment the good work resonates with them, the moment they accept the good work, and they know your intention is good, it's not just because you want to bait them alone. You are just loving on them. The tendency to accept you increases. Am I making sense? Because another thing I've seen churches do is that we do the cookout, we do the this, simply because we just want them to come to church. And they can smell it. Remember who their father is. Their father is a master deceiver, so they've learned some of his tricks. They know that it's just a bait. Even a fish in the ocean or in the river, after a while, begins to see that when you see that long thing that has a hook, no matter what they are offering you, run away. So it doesn't work anymore. So Jesus was teaching us, how do we get our communities? For all the good works, we stone thee not. Put another way, when you come with good works, the doors are open. Saints, we need to win our world. We need to win our world. We have a mandate to do that. We have a responsibility. There are some things that break my heart all the time. When I see people dying, I was in South Africa preaching in one of our church. We have a church in, in Johannesburg, South Africa. And we, we moved to this beautiful suburb close to a something in the city of Johannesburg. And just across, there's this other community they called, um, see Alexandra, they call it. Just, there's so much prosperity here and so much poverty here. A lot of the young ladies, teenage pregnancies, Young, uh, young mothers in abundance, living in all kinds of makeshift arrangements. And I came to church, I saw our pastor, his wife, they were all interceding, asking for souls to come into the kingdom. And I said to them, can you correct this? Correct this. Uh, there is so much you can do with those girls. I said, your church hall here, over there in South Africa, I said, convert it. To all kinds of trade. Those mothers, a number of them, no education. A, a number of them, no skills. I said, can you start doing something for them? Can you just go there and show them love? Shower love on them. 
Do what you need to do because it is a mandate from heaven. Listen, the Holy Ghost is not just for tongues. How God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and power first to do good works. Let your light so shine that men may see your good tongues. No, your good works. So that they can give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It's the two mandates. God has built this church. God is, I hope you know that this church is going to four services, five services, until you will be compelled to expand this hall. How many of you know that? Come on. Can I have that amen ring like you believe it? God is going to do that. How many of you know that resources will not be a problem for fountain of grace? How many of you know that beauty, glory, prosperity, and honor is in this house? If you have an amen, come on, can I hear it louder? Come on, come on, come on, come on. I know this is a thought service. I know we are getting tired gradually, but we're almost there. It's important for us to understand that after all of that, what next? I come as a servant of God, as a friend of this house, by the privilege of my relationship with my covenant brother to speak to you, fountain of grace. God is calling us to the dual mandate. God is calling us to the dual mandate. God is asking us to begin to reach out. There are people who need that. In my last few minutes, let me show you a few scriptures as I begin to wrap up. Can we just read some of these things? Oh, I tell you what is in there. In Proverbs chapter 21 verse 13, these are things that the church cannot lose sight of. Proverbs 21 13. Oh, I want you to see some of these profound scriptures. I want you to see it. That's why I'm waiting. In Proverbs 21, 13, then after that we go to Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 9. He said, whoso stopped his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. Oh God, why does God want us to take care of the needy? Because he knows he will affect our spirituality. Ask the rich man in the book of Luke chapter 16. The man didn't go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell because he refused to listen to the cry of the needy. He acted like they didn't exist. And God said, no, 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 no. Coming to heaven is grace. Your prosperity is grace. And for you to want to enjoy these two graces and deny grace to somebody at your door, you can't qualify to enter. Can I show you Deuteronomy? Go with me to chapter 15. I want to show you a few things as we anchor today. In chapter 15 verses 9 to 11. Deuteronomy chapter 15, 9 to 11. He said, beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart. Saying, the seventh year, that's the year of release, the year of jubilee, is at hand. And your eye be evil against thy poor brother. And thou givest him nothing. And he cry unto the Lord against thee. And it be what? It be seen unto thee. The next verse, he said, Thou shalt surely compulsory, required, mandatory, obligated. You shall surely. It's on an option. You shall surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him. Because sometimes, out of helping and helping, we start complaining. What side would you prefer to be? The side of the one giving or the side of the one receiving? Because for that, this thing, the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works. And in order that put us a hand unto the next verse, verse 11. See the icing on the cake. Can you give me verse 11? Yes, verse 11, the next verse. Verse 11. He said, for the poor shall never cease out of thy land. I know you have them in Massachusetts. We have them a lot in, in Atlanta. The poor will never cease in your land. Therefore, I command you. I command you, I command you, I command you. It is an instruction. It's not a debate. It's not whether we should or we shouldn't. The question is what should we do? Thou shalt open thy hand wide unto thy poor brother and to the needy in thy land. In thy land. There's so much resources in the global church to make a difference. Can I be honest with you? The church has not been as much like Jesus. 
The apostles came to Jesus and said, where shall we have enough money to buy bread in the wilderness to feed this thousand? Hear the instruction of our Savior. See to it. Whatever it will take, see to it, do it. That instruction has not changed. We've got to be the hell. We've got to, listen, listen. Whatever we need to do. And it doesn't have to be the church. There are individuals here. You carry a burden for people. All kinds of things. There are young men in this society that need father figures. There are no young ladies that need decent mothers like I can see in this house. Who will show them the way. There's more to life than just being blessed. After all, eternity beckons. Eternity beckons. I call it the dual mandate. It is not enough to save sinners. That's spiritual. There is a physical dimension that we cannot afford to abdicate. So James chapter 4 verse 17. James 4 17 the New Testament now says, For him that knoweth to do good and faileth to do it to him, it's a sin. It's a sin. It's not, I'm not just trying to be an activist. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is a sin. We saw that in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 15. We see it in the New Testament. Above all, we see Jesus live it out. He's our example. He's our pattern. What he did is the way to go. And heaven backed it up by saying, this is the reason God anointed him. Or put another way, the reason God opened the door, the reason God gave him wisdom, the reason God gave him favor, the reason God gave him resources, the reason God gave him skill, the reason God gave stuff, is because I want him to do good and heal all those who are oppressed of the devil. So saving them from sin and healing their disease is not enough. It's half of the mandate. It's a dual mandate. To do good and to do all of that. I heard a preacher say once, that we are not salvation army. Our job is not to feed the poor. And I felt like saying to that preacher, you need to go back to Sunday school and see Jesus feed the people. What are you talking about? Jesus fed the people. Men and brethren, can I challenge you? That dream God has put in your heart to become the hands and solution. May we rise up to it. In the name of Jesus Christ. I said in the name of Jesus Christ. In Matthew's gospel chapter 25 from verse 31 to 46 such a long read we can attempt it here. Jesus began to speak on the last days and the people said whence did we see you hungry? Whence did we see you naked? When did we see you in prison? When? And Jesus looked at them like you mean you still don't understand. As long as you didn't do it to them you didn't do it to me. I don't know about you. I want my obedience to be complete. I don't want to look good to people. I just want to look good to God. My striving is to please him. I want, to, I want my sacrificial living not to be a lip talk. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I just want to love God and let that love in my heart pour out to people. Please stand with me. Please stand with me. Are you asking, what is the next assignment? There are souls needing to be born again. Actually, one of the messages I prepared had to do with evangelism. But the Lord asked me to do this. There are souls waiting to be born again. Can I beg us? Please, let's not be selfish. There's so much glory in this house. So much glory in this house. You come in here, the atmosphere is healing, it's therapeutic. There's love, there's warmth. You know, oh God. The Bible says, as we fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Can you just lift your two hands to heaven and say, Lord, 
I surrender to the dual mandate. Make me your hand. Make me your ear. Use me. Extend. Extend your love through me. Make me relevant for my generation. Make me relevant for time and eternity. Can somebody talk to the Lord? Can somebody please open your mouth and say, Lord, use me. Use me. Use me. I don't want my life wrapped all around me. Make me a vessel. Help me to be like Jesus. Help me, oh God, as it was with Cornelius. Let a memorial be established in my name in heaven because of my arms and my prayer, because of my spirituality and my physical intervention. Thank you, my Father. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. Thank you for watching. For more information, please contact the church at Fountain of Grace, 427 Turnpike Street, Canton, Mass, 02021. Or give us a call at 781-821-1121. You can email us at admin at fogbos.org. Or visit us online at fogbos.org.